if I can get just a quick show of hands. How many people learned in school that in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and proved to everyone that the world was actually round? Anybody? Right. This is one of the first memorable nuggets of information that we learned about the Middle Ages, but the trouble is, it's not true. People already knew that the Earth was a sphere, and there's plenty of evidence to show it. So for starters, here's a picture of England's Richard II in Westminster Abbey about 100 years before Columbus sailed. And in his hand, he's got a globe to show his power on Earth. Here's a picture that's now in Belgium's Royal Library from about 30 years before Columbus sailed. And in it, you can see the Earth, the sky, a fiery atmosphere, and the stars beyond. In fact, well over a thousand years before Columbus ever got on a boat, the ancient Greeks had calculated the circumference of the Earth using geometry, and modern measurements show they were only about 70 meters off, a distance so small that our Olympians can run it in about seven seconds. So I can show you plenty more evidence and point to the many times that historians have disproved the flat Earth thing, but what I really want to talk to you today about is why we continue to tell and retell this myth and why we need to change our thinking. When we learn about history, the emphasis is often placed on those things that we find hilarious or shocking. And pretty much everything that we take in afterwards confirms that negative impression. We watch movies and TV shows that emphasize brutality and bad decisions. And we tell ourselves stories about how people were primitive and superstitious, how they never bothered to get clean, how they were unscientific and unreasonable, and we pass along this information without actually wondering if we're looking at the whole picture. We carry around this notion that because we're the latest models of humankind and because we have a lot of access to information, that means that we are smarter than the people who lived before us. We like to think of history as a story of continuous forward progress from left to right and at the pinnacle, us. And in a way, this is perfectly natural, especially if we accept Darwin's theory of evolution. But if we look back to a common Western idea of civilization, so say 3,000 years, that's only about 120 generations. Not enough to have made any real significant evolutionary progress. I mean, men still have nipples, right? So we're not X-Men yet, and it's going to be a while before we get there. And what this means in practical terms is that our brains are just about indistinguishable from the brains that built the pyramids and the brains that wrote Magna Carta and the brains that lived and loved on Turtle Island long before Columbus. Now, they may not have had the same technology that we do, but they had our innate intelligence. And if you bring someone forward from the past, I bet that once they got over the culture shock, they'd be just as good at using a smartphone as we are. Now, besides me telling you that you need to cut your great-great-granny some slack, the question, as always, is so what? Why does it matter if we underestimate the smarts of our ancestors? Now, as a historian, I can tell you that everybody thinks that their moment is crucial or pivotal, and I can also tell you that everybody's right. There's never a real insignificant moment. But this moment, right now, we are facing some huge challenges. Climate change. Artificial intelligence, overcrowding, space exploration. And if we choose to dismiss all of history before living memory, then we miss out on the chance to learn from people who have experienced similar things before. For example, one of the easiest periods for us to dismiss is the so-called Dark Ages, which happened between what people call the fall of the Roman Empire and around the Norman conquest of England. So really roughly about 500 to 1100 AD. And I think that when we picture this time in our minds, we picture a lot of mud and people carrying torches and drawn swords because that's what we see in our storytelling. But the truth is that people were writing books and they were creating music and art at this time, just as at any other time. And one of the things they were creating were books of home remedies for common illnesses. This is Bald's Leech Book. It's one of the many treasures in the British Library, and it contains all sorts of really interesting information, like advice on how to cure madness by whipping someone with a porpoise skin. And what we're looking at right now is a cure for infected eyes, and it's a mixture of garlic and wine and cow bile. You put it all together and you let it steep for nine days, and then you apply it to your eye with a feather. 
Now, there's a lot about this that seems pretty far-fetched, and we might dismiss all of Bald's Leech book based on the porpoise suggestion alone. But this recipe has recently been recreated at the University of Nottingham with some surprising results. It turns out that it's pretty great at killing a superbug called MRSA. In fact, it looks like it may be more effective or faster at killing MRSA than the leading antibiotic. Now this is important because as we keep using more and more antibiotics, more and more bacteria are becoming resistant to them because bacteria evolve a lot faster than we do. So it's really important that we keep looking for new cures for these superbugs. Now, I'm not saying that we should start whipping people with porpoise skins to see if that works. But what I am saying is we need to give our ancestors a bit more credit for their knowledge of the natural world. They used to pack wounds with peat moss because it led to fewer infections. And we now know that the molds that grow in peat moss have antibiotic properties. They chewed and they brewed willow bark to cure pain and fever. And now we now synthesize something very similar to make aspirin. In fact, in ancient Rome, they used electric eels for shock therapy to cure migraines and chronic pain. And while many, if not most, of the cures that happened before the 20th century involved reciting a prayer or an incantation, we can now measure the effects of positive thinking on the healing process. Now, Bald's Leech Book is called a leech book because leech is an Anglo-Saxon word for doctor. Doctors used to use leeches to reduce swelling by draining excess blood. And modern medicine has come back around to using leeches for the same purpose. Just as they've come back around to using maggots to clear dead flesh from otherwise healthy wounds. It's true. In fact, the American Food and Drug Administration regulates leeches and maggots as medical devices, and they have since 2004. So, sometimes timeless wisdom can be pretty gross, but it works. Now, certainly not all these cures are going to be as effective as we might hope. But cures aren't the only thing that we can learn from looking at the works of history's doctors and healers. One of the most devastating things to ever happen to humankind was the Black Death, which hit Europe in 1347, killing between a third and a half of the entire population. So if you look around this room and you picture between a third and half of the people just gone, you get an idea of what the death toll was like. Now, history books make the most of the silliest of plague remedies, but I think it's fair to say that if half of this audience was dying of plague, the other half would do just about anything to survive. And some of the things they did, like smelling certain flowers, probably wouldn't have worked, but other things would have helped. For example, the word quarantine comes to us from the 40-day isolation period imposed on infected ships during the Black Death. Now, some people did go around praying and whipping themselves because they thought it might please God, but that didn't mean that everybody gave up on an earthly cure. French doctor said, sure, definitely pray, but this does not mean forsaking doctors. For the Most High created earthly medicine, and although God alone cures the sick, he does so through the medicine which in his generosity he's provided. Now, those same French doctors in 1348 at the University of Paris were asked to come up with their best guesses as to where the plague came from and how to stop it. And I think that moderns might think that the beginning of their work was kind of silly because it's mostly about astrology, but then they get into the possible environmental causes. The entire last year, they said, has had unexpected weather. Winter was warmer than usual, summer was colder, but the whole of the last year was unseasonably wet. And they quote ancient Greek wisdom and say, a year of many fogs and damps is a year of many illnesses something every modern kindergarten teacher can attest. <laughs> they also thought that the plague might have been caused by something they called corrupted air, and that the, the corrupted air may have been stirred up by weather or recent earthquakes. Because everyone has to breathe, they said, everyone is at risk from the corrupted air. And it turns out that they were right. Modern scientists and historians now believe that the Black Death was a combination of bubonic a pneumonic plague, meaning it started out being transmitted through infected flea bites, but then it evolved to be transmitted through airborne droplets spread by coughing and sneezing. So in that sense, it definitely was breathing that would get you sick. And scientists have also used ice core samples and tree ring data to show that weather is indeed connected to epidemic disease. Two of the most devastating plagues in history, 
the Plague of Justinian, which hit the Mediterranean in the 6th century, and the Black Death, which hit Europe, Asia, and Africa in the 14th century, both followed periods of massive volcanic activity and unseasonably wet weather. And it looks like the recurrences of plague that happened all the way up into Shakespeare's day followed similar weather pattern. So suddenly, looking back at the weather that immediately preceded the Black Death seems very important. And it is. As we all know, our climate is changing rapidly. And the bacterium that was directly responsible for the plague of Justinian, the Black Death, and the third plague pandemic, which killed millions in the 19th century, that bacterium, called Yersinia pestis, still exists in hot spots in Asia, Africa, and even the United States. Now, we can kill Yersinia pestis with antibiotics, provided we're ready. So it's really important that we learn as much as we can about historical outbreaks so that we can be better prepared next time. And because people wrote down the symptoms and the path of the devastation, we can now follow the skeletal remains and plague burial pits and learn more about how the disease grew and spread. And we can plan for other outbreaks of different epidemic diseases. Now, like superbugs and climate change related illness, Another super modern problem that we could use some help with is the dilemma of artificial intelligence. Now, believe it or not, clockwork robots existed as far back as the ancient world and everywhere from Japan to the Middle East. This is Monk Thought. He is a 16th century robot, which you can find in the Smithsonian. And his robe is removed in this picture so you can see the gears that allowed him to move around and greet people. Now, historical robots are a far cry from the androids that we have today or the programs that are creating their own languages. But theologians and philosophers have been deb debating for millennia what makes us different from that. What makes us human? Aristotle thought it was reason and the drive for excellence. Thomas Aquinas thought it was the desire to know God. Mencius, an ancient Chinese philosopher, believed that humans have innate compassion. Now, as our brilliant machines become more brilliant, and perhaps more like us, it makes sense to go back and look at those things that we've always said separate us from the other species. Now, if looking back to the past for help with science and technology seems like a bit of a stretch, what about the many ways in which our ancestors tried to help us with practical wisdom? The ancient Mesopotamians were wise enough to tell us not to make big decisions while drinking heavily. Medieval courtly lovers told us to beware of gold diggers. Medieval monks built green space into their monasteries to rest the souls and the eyes of the brothers who'd been sitting at desks all day. Ancient Egyptian and Greek women told us to use a contraceptive if we don't want to get pregnant. They used pomegranate seeds and animal dung to increase their estrogen and disrupt their pH. Pretty much everything on the modern magazine stand has been covered at one time or another. Monks from all different religions over millennia have been teaching us how to find inner peace, get enough sleep, eat in moderation, meditate, be grateful. 15th century writers told us to have respect and fund education for women and girls. Ancient philosophers like the Stoics told us to live a life of disciplined virtue, although Confucius said, I have yet to meet the man who likes virtue as much as he loves sex. Elders in indigenous cultures continue to pass on practical and philosophical wisdom, including the very smart advice of paying attention to the wisdom of your elders. Now, what I love about history is the many different ways in which our ancestors tried to help us to live better lives, to learn from their mistakes and their heartaches. They don't always get it right, like the porpoise thing. Sometimes they don't even get most things right. And sometimes they just serve as, a, as an example of who we don't ever want to be. But while we take our current living relatives and friends' advice with a grain or two of salt, we let them sit at the table with us to share their ideas. We really need to let our ancestors sit at the table with us and hear what they have to say and why they say it, instead of just dismissing their knowledge as primitive or superstitious because it's old or we don't understand the thinking behind it. Technology hasn't necessarily made us all smarter, 
If you don't believe me, remember that while well, hundreds and thousands of years ago people knew the Earth was a sphere, there are people today that can look at photos from space and still believe it's flat. <laughs> now, I'm not saying all the answers are in the past. If they were, we'd have no problems left to solve. But what I am saying is that if we find ourselves using words like primitive or superstition when we talk about the past, that we look to make sure that there's evidence to support those conclusions and that it's not just our tendency to see history as a straight line of progress. This is our moment in time and we are facing immense challenges. To meet them, we can draw on the wisdom of the billions of people living on Earth right now. And we can draw on the wisdom of the billions of people who lived on the planet before us. But first, we have to see history in three dimensions and really consciously take note of people's brilliance and their successes, as well as their failures, as hilarious as those may be. There is so much that we don't know about the past and so many exciting discoveries that we're making every day. But if we choose to ignore the wisdom of the past, or if we continue to rip, misrepresent it by perpetuating myths and stereotypes, then we're adding exponentially to the things that we don't know. And we're limiting our ability to solve current problems. We can do better. We can respect the past. We can learn from it, and we can build ourselves a bright future. Thank you.